Anywhere but here. founded the uh, Little People of America in 1957. Twenty-one people attended the first meeting representing nine different states and at this convention now we have close to 1600 and not only that but we have 101 people uh, from 18 foreign countries attending and so we have pardon the expression but we have grown. I couldn't do anything, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. I was just like staring at everybody and my mouth dropped to the floor. It was, it was amazing. And then after a while I kind of got used to it. And It was kind of sad though when I left because I don't have little people around me. What I like about coming to the convention is it's the only week of the year that you're on equal footing with everyone else. The other 51 weeks, you're you're, you can do very well in, in, in the outside world, but you're, you're never on equal grounds because of your stature. Here, everything is equal, and I find that um, interesting and challenging. One week in your life, you are quote unquote normal because the majority of the people around you are short. Whereas in your little community in hometown America, you might be the only short person in that town. And where do you find a girlfriend your size? Where do you get the answer to your clothing problems? Where do you find the right medical doctor to go to to get those answers? And these are 
tremendous benefits that have evolved over the years and through the efforts of those founding members that gave of themselves and were able to have the vision that this could be something someday. The reason I decided to come to the convention, it was all kind of, it was weird the way it happened. I didn't know about the Restricted Growth Association in Britain. I was shopping one day and I was in a shop that I'm never usually in and I bumped into this girl who's five foot ten and she says, oh, where did you get your pants? They're really cool. And I'm thinking, my goodness, where's she asking? Because she, why is she asking? Because she's so tall. And she must have read my mind. She says, oh, they're not for me, they're for my mother. She's only three foot tall. And I'm thinking, blimey, I feel like a giant. So she told me all about the Restricted Growth Association in Scotland and I became a member two months ago and then the Scottish coordinator told me all about this national convention and I just thought that was too much of a coincidence bumping into her daughter and I just feel it's fate coming here. You don't see a lot of small people in Scotland. What's it like being the parent of a dwarf infant? It's uh, joy. Probably the hardest part of being a parent of a Dwarf infant is putting up with the people who stare, and more than more than likely the un the unasked questions, like when you tell Ryan that he's he's three and a half, and you get the look like, well, he's not tall enough to be three and a half, and that's probably the hardest part for me right now is dealing with other people's attitudes. But as far as being a parent, it's a joy. If they ask a question, I will tell them and explain to them the condition and why he is the way he is, and hopefully they won't have that again. As far as the stairs, there's nothing I can do, and it's basically a waste of energy, but I'm learning to deal with it. It's, it's important for him to see that he's not the only one. There's a lot of times when he's at home, he's, he's the only one. My blanket. Okay, let me get your blanket. One, two, three. Okay, one, scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone. Maybe Wait, everyone at the same time, try. that's what 10 might be. But it doesn't work, because we already... As We're two nine. What well, doesn't yeah. matter? You only jump once. Everybody we, can... Uh, you two two people have to go at the same time, two jump. times. Watch the rope, you guys. Please. Yeah. Oh. Oh. No, 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 just listen. Oh. Listen. Oh. Straight through. Through. Straight through. I know, but can you just listen? Yeah. So two people go in and they jump, then they get out. Then one person goes in and they jump 10, then they get out. And then the next person... Next person in there, message that scratch. Two times scratch. One, two, three. Go! You guys gotta step back from the rope. I don't understand how you could just come up with something because you guys are all screaming at one time. So if you go one at a time and give everybody an opportunity to speak, at least so they're heard, if the idea works or we agree upon the idea, then we move on with it. Otherwise, let's just at least give everybody a chance. Can I say something now? Okay. You know, you're going to go last just because you always say something first. I know. I, it's real Laura, quick. Come on. No, no, no. Bye. Come on. Work with We already talked about this, right? Yeah. You, you, you know that you're a strong personality. You know you're a strong personality. I can go. Okay, okay. So. Okay. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. As one's friends start getting taller, one is left behind, and we tend to associate small height with immaturity, with children. And so they're, they're saying their friends develop what are considered, number one, more attractive physical proportions, and number two, physical proportions that we as associate with maturity, adulthood, something that all individuals aspire to. But hanging out and having fun, I think, is probably one of the best things that we could do for him. I mean, that was really my feeling about coming here, was just to submerge him in this atmosphere so that he goes away knowing that there are a lot of others like him, but also that life goes on, and it's going to be great, I mean, for him. It could be, you know, whatever he chooses to do. Who are you going to sell them next? 
he's going to go in for shooting. Come on, Eddie. Come on, Eddie. Anthony is. Come on, Josh. Get in the middle. I think that we're getting the sense that he is, as a 10 year old, you know, every day there's more and more things that he's not becoming involved with with his friends. You know, his younger brother, Andy, just learned to ride a bike. So after dinner in the summer, the kids say, you know, let's hop on our bike and go to the pool. And that's easily said and done for Andy, but it's not for Tom. So he kind of just hangs out by himself and reads and doesn't get involved in that stuff. And pretty much socially all the time, there's things that, you know, 10 year olds do that are incredibly physical. You know, like we played softball a couple weeks ago on a Memorial Day or something like that. And all these families went to a school. And as soon as we got there, all the kids like ran off like across three soccer fields to play kickball and you know Thomas just like looked across these soccer fields and realized that when he got there he wasn't gonna have that much fun anyway so he just kind of sat with us and read. starts about 800 for a mountain bike like that uh -huh. and it's got a chromoly steel frame and it's 14 speeds and it's fully custom I build the frame to fit her if you're gonna get one you might as well get one of these mountain bikes 14 speed because I mean it's gonna be like the coolest bike in the neighborhood right now for sure <laughs> and then as she grows the other kids are just gonna get ones that are as cool you can't get much you know better I could build average size bikes and, and I could sell more bikes and I could make more money but it's, it's just so satisfying to do this because you know, hear people say that you know, I couldn't have had a bike if you wouldn't have been here to build me a bike. I've never ridden a bike. Almost seven. Okay. Okay. Having a little This is a munchkin cat. It's an actual breed of dwarf cat. They have shortened legs. This is a full-grown cat, and uh, you can see how short her legs are. Try to show her off here. Say, okay, kitty. She got a short nerve too. That's okay, baby. She's nervous. The children just love them, and re and they they identify with them, and they see the cats as like as a, a positive affirmation of their their stature and their their physical characteristics. And they they see the cat as very agile and sweet and loving, and it's just a really they just like it. They love these cats. A friend of mine and I saw Heather and two other girls that she's friends with across the room and at, at the big dance and we're like, oh boy, we got to go up and dance with the, them, you know, and she's really cute and all that. The three of them are completely ignoring us, completely blowing us off and uh, pretty much humiliated us because we uh, thought we were all cool trying to go up and dance with you and then you just ignored us. And I don't remember that at all. And which is more tragic. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you meet somebody in here and you know they're the love of your life or it's going to work out, but you're going to have a lasting relationship. Other times you're just not sure. I go through this in my not sure stage. You know, you can meet a guy here for a week, and for a week it's fun. For a week you're dancing, you're going out to dinner, you're living in a hotel. For a week it's really fun, but then you get home and it's, it's a whole different environment, so you don't know if that guy is the special guy or if you just had a good time at a convention. You also, you know, you also see each other in a different light after you get taken out of this, this context. So, ladies, yeah. ladies, yeah. ladies, yeah. ladies, yeah. ladies, yeah. ladies, ladies, yeah. ladies, 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 Well, ever since I saw a little person, especially a man, it's just like, oh wow, it'd be a lot easier if I could just marry a man that I could see face to face, that I could dance with, you know, that, that you could be compatible.
instead of being with somebody average height, this, it's just not the same. It's always been an, a lifetime dream for me. When I was dating an average sized person, the, the insecurity factor was like higher. And it wasn't necessarily that so much about what I felt, it was what does everyone else think about, you know, every, it's kind of funny because when we're together, everybody immediately goes, oh, isn't that cute, isn't that perfect? Like, oh, they found each other and that's absolutely perfect. And when I, anytime you're in a mixed relationship, I felt like everybody was judging it so much more, like, why is she with him, you know? And that may have been totally inaccurate, but that's the feelings you get being in it. You, you know, you're constantly, like, looking around, what does everybody think of it? And that's hard, I mean, that would be hard to deal with. It's something we don't have to deal with. We get the, oh, isn't it cute? Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so out of those, which one do you pick? Which two? Number two! I got home from work that night and Biz said, you know, you need to talk to your son because he's upset about this dating thing. And, and I went in and talked to him and apparently there was a young girl that uh, he had asked to go and she turned him down and he was despondent about it. So I, uh, you know, told him when I was growing up, I, girls always broke up with me and I was kind of a dork and nobody wanted to go out with me and stuff like that. And I also decided at that point in time to kind of broach the subject of you know, dating average sized girls and the fact that he was short statured. So, you know, I said, Tom, you know, you should know that you're probably, during the course of your life, there'll be girls that will not date you just because you're a dwarf. And he kind of looked at me and said, Dad, you know, maybe she didn't want to date me because I'm a dork, but I don't think she didn't want to date me because I'm a dwarf, <laughs> which I thought was a great, you know, just said a lot about the way he perceived himself, you know, so I guess we're doing a pretty good job from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He'll kill you for telling that story. <laughs> <laughs> It's really bizarre here because it is seven days long and you know anybody else can go on a normal date meet somebody a few days you know take a few days off figure out if they like them or not and then you know have another date and kind of build something but when you only have seven days and everything's so intense that you know you're suddenly with somebody and it's a serious relationship and you don't even know the person you don't even realize if, if you like them, all, but all of a sudden you're in this committed, serious relationship, and then you have to like deal with it that it's long distance then. And it's, it seems pretty unnatural, and you know, it's, it's a major, intense, pressured thing. And like you were saying, it's, and if it's not happening, then that's even more traumatic for you and for your psyche. Because if it doesn't happen here, where is it gonna happen? I mean, I think that's the mentality too. Well, we've talked about things, you know. We just we want first we want to get to know each other, you know, and and because I mean you don't really get to know anybody, you know, a week, a, one week that's not too much time, and everybody's always around, you know, and you can't really talk and unless you go off like we did last night. But uh, anyway, uh, we we might hit it off because we we're basically alike. You know, I mean, he's got an, a little arm, I've got a little arm, but I've got a hand, so that, that's going to help between us there. And, and uh, we talked about me moving if, if, it, if it came down to that point, and I told him there's really nothing in Texas that might, you know, would tie me down, and I'd, you know, probably move out there with him. And so, uh, you know, of course he told me I had to go to work and do all this, you know, honeydew stuff for him. And, you know, how it goes. Got to straighten him up for one thing, because he's a mess. <laughs> I know, I get this little funny feeling inside every time I'm with him. I, I don't, I've never had this little feeling before, you know, but I don't know, he gives me this little, I shouldn't be telling him this, because his head's going to get about yay big. 
my friends and everything have noticed a real change in me, you know, because I used to kind of, I mean, I would be happy at conventions, but I would also be lonely, you know. You, you, you see everybody else with, with their dates or, you know, when you, when you go to banquet, that's, that's the hardest thing to do, is to go to banquet by yourself without, a, you know, somebody to go with. And you're sitting there and you're watching everybody smooching and dancing on the dance floor and flirting around, you know. And, and then when they leave, of course, they'll, you know, they've got their honey out there. And you go home to same old, same old, you know. Just, you're just bored. But not this year, boy. I did okay. I think we still have that same, the same ideal appetite for what is beautiful that average sized people have. It's probably even intensified here based upon the stress of the time constraint of trying to make the most out of people's relationships. Um, um, I, like for example, I think the, the, the little people that look the least like a little person, if their limbs are generally straight and in proportion of, of each other, they are deemed the most attractive people, so, the, so they will have the most successful time here. Um, the, the, the really little people, the people in the wheelchairs, I think have a harder time here. And it's really, it's really confusing and frustrating because you, because you realize you're doing to them what has been done to you so long. And now you can't really blame them. You, you, you can't really blame them for turning you down for a dance. For, for just looking down at you and going, yeah, right, you know? Um, be, because you're doing the same thing here to someone who's smaller than you, or someone who doesn't walk as straight as you. It almost like gets emotional for me because my, um, I hate to leave it. I really like playing. But I have a son, um, and I think for guys, it can be more competitive when you're playing in an average size thing. So for the first time, I have a little boy eight years old, so for the first time he can really compete and feel like he's competing with people on the same level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's good. What'd you get that in? Uh, um, volleyball. You got the silver? Mm -hmm. I can pull this off. No, I'm fine. Okay. Ready? Are we done with the first one? Oh. Yeah, first one's got it. Let go over there. I don't want no help on the other side. Don't touch the butt. Don't touch the I just want help. Oh, yeah. Okay. Where's Jeff? Right here. You warmed up? I did too. Uh... 
My name is Doug Farrell. I'm here for the IPC sanctioned uh, national powerlifting meet and um, I hold the world record in bench press at 365. I'm 4'6", weigh 155 pounds. This is not no, f you know, just for fun because they have a lot of competitions here that, you know, get the kids in to have a lot of fun. But this is, you know, this is, you know, for you to be on Olympic status, which is really I'm proud of that I have accomplished that I went to the 1996 Paralympic Games in Atlanta and out of 30 countries, I placed in the top 10. He's got to let it go, let it go. Start. Up, 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 up. Racket. Yeah. My son is not even able to compete with uh, normal sized kids, and that's pretty tough. Uh, this is what I want to take back to them that they are, you know, they can play basketball with anybody, and if they keep that intensity level, then things will be pretty good for them. They all have the same thing they want to do, they all want to win. Uh, we, in our society, we teach them that that seems to be pretty important. These kids pick up on that just as much as anybody else, but down here, this is where they shine a little bit. When Billy Barty met with 20, 30 people in Reno in 1957, they actually called themselves Midgets of America. Midgets is now considered a very derogatory slang term that we never use. The, the popular word to use was midget, and uh, because of P.T. Barnum. As we educated ourselves, we discovered there's no such thing as a midget. A midget is really a pituitary or a hyperpituitary type of dwarf but belongs to the proportionate type of dwarfism. Now, of the disproportionate type, uh, you have over 200 different types now that the medical world has classified. I'm a cartilage hair syndrome hypoplasia, in case you want to say that instead of Billy, you know. But anyways, uh, and it goes on and on and on. And as the public says midget, then we correct them. The most obvious thing about these folks may be the short stature, but actually that, that's not actually the most problematic. The problem is that the proportion of the bones doesn't fit the rest of the body, and sometimes various structures inside the body get compressed. Probably the most often is the spinal cord, and that interferes with people's difficulty to walk. So a lot of what we try to do is to make sure that uh, paralysis and pain and loss of feeling don't set in. She's had a lot of medical. She had uh, brain surgery when she was five years old. She's had four laminectomies on her back, three fusions. She's had five surgeries on her legs. She's had uh, rods put in her back. She's had a lot of stuff going on. To see her now, if you saw her two years ago in a body cast, dancing on the floor in a fat, flat wheelchair with guys pushing her around to see her now. It's really neat to see how much progress she's made. There are individuals we've seen who've literally gone through dozens of, uh, of operations. And one of the amazing things that, about how welcome we are at this convention is realizing that uh, these people have had more doctors inflicted on them in their lifetimes than most people ever do. They figured it out that she needed a, an NP tube, a nasal pharyngeal tube, down one side of her nose to hold her tongue down to help her breathe. And we do have to be careful of her airway. Her chest is not so big. And that just the sheer length 
from here to here. She doesn't have that for fluid and phlegm and things like that, all that nasty stuff, to go. And I can't say enough good things about our Dr. Tewitt. <laughs> we love Dr. Tewitt, don't we? And again, she was in our delivery room, which was a blessing, such a blessing. Everything about you is a blessing, though, isn't it? Because you're my blessing. Yes, you are. I love you. <laughs> you're my blessing, aren't you? One of the ma many appealing things uh, about dealing with these folks as patients is, is that they, they tend to be very non-demanding as, as patients and have a very positive outlook on life. And one wonders w why that is. I used to joke to my colleagues that when I went to see average sized people in the clinic, I would heal, often or is not hear a huge barrage of complaints and spend a lot of time examining them very carefully to find out if there really was anything wrong with them to account for the complaints. And it's almost diametrically the opposite when I know my next patient is a short statured patient. You ask them, how are they doing? Doc, I'm doing great, I'm having the best time and so on. And then as soon as you get they're walking into the room, they're hobbling in on crutches, they can barely get up onto the table, some of them. This reflex is gone, this muscle's paralyzed, feelings lost here, and you're checking them, and I says, well, you know, doesn't this bother you? He says, well, isn't that normal? Some of it, I suspect, is adjustment, because I think if we have adversity and, and modest expectations of health and life, all one's life, then one, perhaps adjust one's attitude to deal with that. Of course there are exceptions, there are complainers and ungrateful folks in any group, but as a general rule I, I'll stand by that statement. It's a, it's a much more upbeat, positive group of people than many other patient groups I can think of. And that certainly is a large part of the reason I keep coming back. The purpose of uh, this organization was really to get little people together, to discuss our mutual problems, and to tell the bigger world out there that all little people, you don't pat them in the head, and they all don't work circuses. There are other professions, and we proved that immediately. I'm Anthony Soares. I, uh, work, I live in Hoboken, New Jersey, right across the river from New York City, and I'm an art director for an advertising agency in Manhattan. I'm a fully credentialed public school teacher. I'm a substitute teacher right now. And I also have a motivational speaking uh, business on the side. I'm Lee Uniak, I'm from San Francisco, and I'm publisher of Computer Gaming World. My name is Ron Puro. Um, I'm an electrical engineer for IBM Corporation uh, in Burlington, Vermont. My name is Rachel Klein, and I'm from New York City. I'm a real estate attorney. Well, my name is Kenneth Lee. I live in Buffalo. I'm moving to Portland, Oregon, and I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. My story was that uh, when I decided to go into the business world, I was willing to take any job that I could get to get in and get started, start at a clerical level or anything. Uh, we realized that, that we must be as good or better than the next one in order to succeed because there are a few knocks against you. Climbing the corporate ladder for a short stature person is a lot harder than climbing it, I think, for an average sized person. Not to say that's impossible, though. Maybe, maybe it has nothing to do with my height if I don't get the promotion. But then, as the person who's four foot two, you, you see the person who's six foot one, blonde, and, you know, kind of a waspy, and you say, you know, oh, did he get promoted because he's, he's that and I'm this, or, or did he get to, or I'm merit? Back in the 60s, there were tremendous barriers in the professional world for a lot of our little people members. I can remember occasions where a little lady would become trained as a school teacher and she would go to apply for the school teacher's job and the local board would vote her down and would not hire her because of her size. And uh, this has occurred in many professions and the public in general just sometimes accept you for how tall you stand and rather than how tall you are from within. What's up, John? Run it out, run it out. I'll never get up and bat again. I'll never get up and bat again. I'll never get involved with 27 people out there. 
I think it was a lot harder when I was younger, but now I use my height to my advantage, and I, I like the way I look now. Um, and I know I've got a, a lovely personality, and I feel attractive, so it doesn't get to me as much. But there are days where I wish that people wouldn't stare. People really need to be educated, that it's okay to look different, and it was just the way you were made. And how I personally stepped into my power was by dealing with my repressed anger and rage and frustration. One person that I studied with was named Anna Halperin, and she taught me to use the expressive arts to deal with my negative emotions. And she taught us the monster dance. I'll show you what it looks like. I hate you! Why me? What's so special about being called names? That's the monster dance. You guys can do it too. Um, I would say the culture's definitely different in America. Here it's far more positive and in your face people are proud to be dwarfs and they talk about their conditions and they're very assertive. They want to be in complete control of their lives and they will ask their doctors, they want answers. Whereas in Britain, well in my experience, I still don't know what my condition is and I'm 29 years old. The doctors can't tell me. I've got to go back to Scotland, get a sp an x-ray of my spine and send it over here. When I was 16 I had both my legs lengthened because I had this, this urge to be taller and now at 29 I just know it feels great to be different. I, I'd rather look different than slot into society. Every time we go out, it's uh, you know, it's an experience. I mean, I remember one of the first times we were not as we were on a date without being at an LP function. Uh, we were in Chicago and we went up the John or no the Sears Tower, and uh, you know, we were awkward enough on a date anyway. And then there's this group of school kids. Oh that was having this little field trip and happened to be in line in front of us. And we were like, you know, we were better than the Sears Tower to them. You know, we were better than anything they'd seen in Chicago. And you're just trying to have like a normal conversation and talk to the person that you like and you're like the show at the same time. I want to believe. Yeah, and that's yeah. just kind of a hard thing that, you know, you have every right to be on a date and you have every right to be in public and yet you're made to feel like you're some kind of total freak act. You know, I know that's harsh, but that's kind of the way you feel. Oh, I have a lot of things in life that came up, you know, I mean, I'll never forget one instance, I'm in a golf tournament in Dayton, Ohio, and actually we're all having breakfast, and this one guy come up to me and starts laughing, and he says, oh, hey, are you short? When are you gonna grow up? And I said, I have, and you? And he didn't get it, he just went off laughing, and um, it, 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 it you can always tell when people are staring at you, looking like, you know. I like to go to work and be an educator, but when I go to the mall, I just want my own private time. I can't stop with every kid, you know, and take the time that they deserve to desensitize them to, to people with disabilities. I'll take time every once in a while, you know, I like to do that, but it's so prevalent and so often, and there's so many kids that have that, that need that, that, you know, I mean, I'd give up my life, <laughs> you know, if I did that. It's sort of the old, you know, Hollywood star syndrome, you know, just turn off the cameras for a minute, guys, you know, give me a little peace and serenity here. I was at Gap Kids about a week ago, oh, and um, I was shopping for just, I don't know what, and there was three little kids there, and I wasn't in a good mood, so when I'm not in a good mood, you don't want to stare at me, because I'm just going to go off on you. So, and I, I was just going, these kids were staring at me, so I would be like, what, you know, I'd be like, what's your problem, right? And I know I shouldn't do that, because they're little kids. And so the littlest one goes to the mom, and she goes, she goes, mommy, mommy, look, look at, look at her. And, and the mom goes, oh, oh, honey, that's okay, just be happy you're not her. Oh, I was, <laughs> I was so mad. And I'd hit, and I'd kick, and I'd scream into my pillow, and a lot of times I'd use my voice too, and I'd put the pillow over my voice, and speak specifically to people who would hurt me. And I'd say, I hate you for that, and I'm angry at you for that, and I want you to see me as I am, with all the conviction and authenticity that I really was feeling inside. And as I did that, 
that wall that I had built up around me that I talked about earlier, it started to crumble. And as I started to express my anger and I, I did the monster dance, you know, I expressed it creatively and I expressed it on my bed and I hit my bed and yelled in my pillow and, and, and expressed it in a way that didn't hurt me or anybody else but nonetheless let the energy move. And when I did that, I started to find an internal strength and courage and power. And when I discovered those things, I felt like I had more self-confidence than a lot of big people that I know. I think this is more like just a temporary retreat. It's a release. It's a, it, it's a bubble for us for a, for, a, for a week and three other times a year for a weekend to, to, to just be David Tilbury. You know, just to be that that person on on an equal footing. One one thing that um, I had most a difficult time with when I first started going to conventions is figuring out my my personality apart from being small. Because people in the average size world, they're like, oh, he drinks, he dances, he he laughs, he sings, he's he's really cool. You know, th they're surprised that, that you like to do those normal things, and all of a sudden, you make friends a lot easier in the average size world. And here, and then you realize that you can't be dependent on, on that. You can't be dependent on this enchantment that other people have of you, because now you're just you, just like you would be if you were average size in the average size world. for the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. It's about a 55 person cast. We have rockettes, um, chorus singers and dancers, uh, skaters, children, little people, and uh, kids, and a Santa Claus. We are looking for about 15 little people this year. We have slots available, about 15 slots available. We're looking for um, people to play the, like, they played various roles throughout the show, but it's mostly for Santa's elves. We really try to, um, we really try to take care of them in the show. I mean, to provide a good salary and, and housing and travel and try to make it a profitable gig for them. I've done it four times and you've done it twice. Yep. Yeah, I was in It's a great fun. Yeah, it's really fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. You know, big houses and you're on stage with a great set and good music and all that. It's really fun. Yeah. You know, I went to school for theater and acting and, you know, when you're at school and when you're not getting paid and you can have all the idealistic, you know, thing. I'm never going to do a part that's for a little person or anything like that. And uh, it's interesting because when I got this show, I was very, you know, very apprehensive about it and very unsure of, you know, I knew friends that had done it and were very happy with it and proud of it. And so, but I was very apprehensive. and. You know, you have 2,000 people out in the house, and a lot of them are kids, and they're having a great time, and they're just loving it. They're having, for two hours, they're having a wonderful time, and you're bringing that to them. And, you know, I, I just kind of hope and believe that people are smart enough to be able to separate the fact that I'm a person, I'm a human, and totally disassociate myself from this fantastical character that I play. Um, I'm a welder, but right now I'm full-time acting. I'm a barrister, and... Munchkin in Munchkin Land, and then I'm an understudy for the mayor. It's you making a costume come alive. Just happens to be a maybe a small costume, opposed to a big costume. What about the parts where you know people come on stage and they come on drunk, or they chase a woman around and they pinch her butt, or they you know like I've seen some things. Or I remember getting a call when um, you know from an, a pr production company saying, you know we'd like you to come to this party and. You know, you would be wearing a diaper, and I'm like letting them listen, and I'm saying, well, what is that? What is that all about? And they said, well, you know, you play a baby, and I said, well, I'm not a baby. I'm an adult. I have, you know, I do this for a living, and I and I and I went to college, and I have a degree, but you want to put me in a diaper? I said, that's humiliating, and the guy got all upset that I lectured him, but you know, and then he slammed the phone on me, but I was kind of glad. I felt like I did my duty, and I had a moral obligation to tell this guy he was exploiting people of short stature. Friends of mine are always saying you ought to be in porno movies. You know, they they think I ought to use my size in a gimmicky, funny way, in a mocking, degrading way, 
to move ahead in life. Um, that is the only equation where you are guaranteed success to, to be little. You, you can be successful in other capacities, but that's probably the most sure thing, to, to, to do funny things, to do wacky things, to, to do um, degrading things based upon not who you are, but what you are. But a lot of little people say, look, you know, they're asking me to do this, it's good work, uh, I can use the money, it's something that uh, they really want, so I'm going to do the work. And hey, it's a free country, and if I want to do it, I can. And we actually go along with that. We, you know, we would be opposed to making laws that says, well, if you're a little person, you can't be in this kind of work. A uh, few things we're very much against. We're against, the, uh, for example, the dwarf tossing that was popular for a while. Uh, we have a few people that have done midget wrestling, even though we consider that kind of beyond what's really acceptable type of thing. Um, we have some people that are, uh, are clowns, but they're clowns because that's what they want to do, and they do it professionally, and they would probably be a clown if they were average size. Uh, as far as uh, physical mobility goes, as far as religion goes, as far as racial goes, we cover the broad spectrum of you know, the human population. And when you come to this conference, you begin to see that. And you see all these people, and you realize they're all short, which is kind of an interesting trait to have in common. But you're not going to be good friends with everybody at this organization, because they can have entirely different tastes and interests than you would ever imagine having. When you're like everybody else, you work hard to be different. But when you're different, you kind of work hard to be like everybody else. When you come to this convention, and you know, if you're walking around, you're saying, you know, you're walking around here, and you feel like you're like everybody else, and then somebody pops up and says, "Oh, I'm gay," or "I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a Baptist," or "I'm this and that," or "I'm Jewish," and they start to say. Well, you're different, and I'm the same as everybody else here. So I don't like different people that are different, you know. So you want to kind of, um, you come here to kind of like live in a fantasy of, of you know, we're we're all the same. I'm like every, you know, and then you, it's kind of like you take, you take that, you, you know, it's cast upon you, and then cast it upon someone else. So you can kind of like make yourself feel better, I think. And I think maybe it's also people where they're coming from the society. I mean, we're just like everybody else, so we're gonna have. We're gonna have bigots in LPA. We're gonna have, we're gonna have really nice people in LPA. We're gonna have people that are very open-minded and liberal. From the 500 to 2,000 uh, dwarfs you see at each convention, it's simply a microcosm of society. Um, the only commonality that most of us have is our short stature, and it's interesting that um, LPA society, uh, at least what you see in the, at these LPA conventions, is not um, more cognizant of acceptance of difference. I'm leaving shortly and it's always sad when you leave because even though sometimes you come and you're not sure if you want to go and you wait the last minute until you decide because you're going to a convention, once you get here it's being in that equal, it's that environment where you're equal and you meet people and you socialize and you, for a week you're in a world that you're not going to be in for another 51 weeks should you decide to go next year. So when you go, there's always a sense of sadness. It always brings tears to my eyes, just because you, I'm, I'm leaving this world, which is kind of like a fantasy. So it's sad. There's a certain sadness to leaving this, this environment. I didn't expect to meet someone, but I have. And, and he came highly recommended. <laughs> and he's a lovely person. His name's Tom. I was introduced to him and I thought, yeah, he's nice, you know. He seemed pretty quiet, he's pretty shy. And I thought, well, they warned me he was pretty shy. But I think that's pretty much an understatement. I was self-conscious thinking, oh God, I'm talking too much to him because I wanted to make a good impression. I think when it clicked, when it, like when I sh sort of thought, wow, you know, I really want to know this one. I was just joking to him about having tequila shots. And, um, and I, wasn't, I didn't think he was interested, so I went off and got a shot myself because I thought I needed it for encouragement anyway, <laughs> to just, you know, to, to talk because it was going to be a long night, I knew, because it's banquet night and they're always long. And 
Yeah, and I sat back down with my shot and he looked at me and he said, oh, it's starting without me. <laughs> and I just looked and went, okay, this is it. And that's when it clicked. It just, I just thought, this is it. My partner in drinking, drinking, my partner in crime. But yeah, and I said goodbye to him this morning because he has to work and it, it wasn't too bad. Actually, it's like yesterday I was sad about it and I talked to him about it. I think I got it all out of my system yesterday. And, and I just sort of thought, well, it's okay because we're going to see each other again and we're hoping to see each other soon. But yeah, and so um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. But I got a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a letter last night and I told her I told her I had a surprise for her. My surprise was that I loved her. And she told me that was the first time ever, anyone's ever said that to her. Um, let's see what happens. Yeah, I met her this week, like Monday night at the dance. And from then on, it's just been, been just one hell of a week. If she ever shows up, maybe I'll give you a story. Oh, uh, she. Tell her. Tell her. <laughs> Hold on. Tell her. Tell her. Tell her. Tell Connie. Tell Connie to come here. No, tell Connie. Her. If, No, should I tell you, tell Connie to come here. Here you go, babe. This is yours. Oh, right wow. foot on you. Thank you. Yeah, you still got my address, right? Did I give you my address? Um, I don't know if you did or not. Here, give me a thing. Just be in Oregon next year, and you know I, I will be there. Dude, I have to. I have to be there. I had fun. You. This is the best. This is the best convention I've been to so far. I mean, I turned 21 this week. I met a beautiful girl. Keep in touch. I promise. I will. Good luck. I will. Oh, I'm gonna have fun. <laughs> oh, believe me. I'll try not to. And behave. Darn! Why well, can't? Behave. No. Yes. I don't have to behave. <laughs> don't make me call you tonight. Okay, well, you can call me tonight. Okay. I don't know what time I'm gonna be in though. I don't you know can what time keep trying. See you around. See you around. Maybe I'll we'll see you sometime this year. Yo, you, you might. <laughs> you never know. Well, turned out better than I thought, guys. So that's it. That was that was my great week here. At the convention. The best week ever. <laughs> well, it's been a great convention. Everything went well. Everybody had a good time. Everybody's exhausted, which in a way is what we're out to accomplish. Nobody got hurt. Everybody had a lot of fun. And the goal now is to get everybody home safely, which I think we're going to do. Uh, I'm trying to get out of here because I got an eight hour drive back to the Bay Area. But every minute was worth it. And uh, I think a lot of new people here for the first time had a great experience. I know the old timers did, which is why they keep coming back. So anyway, we'll see everyone next year in Portland, Oregon. <laughs>